Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. At Bethel, we are in the midst of a stewardship season called Because of God's Great Mercy. Not by our design. We have three lessons offered to us today about riches in some way or another. Amos is concerned about those who live in luxury. Timothy tells us that the love of money is the root of all evil. And Jesus' parable is about a rich man and a poor man. Newsflash, it doesn't turn out so well for the rich fellow. We at Bethel have now gone back to a lectionary series that is used by a large segment of Christianity. After five years of having departed from that, four years of the narrative lectionary and one year of the story. And now in this common lectionary, we have Bible readings assigned to us every Sunday. The assignment for this particular Sunday can be uncomfortable. It can be uncomfortable for a preacher to preach. It may be uncomfortable if the preacher is personally challenged by these words, and it may be uncomfortable for the hearers as you hear these words. First, the prophet Amos. He is very upset with those people who live in luxury. He sees that the poor of Israel in his day do not receive justice. The rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And Amos believes that the rich don't even care. They just sit on their ivory inlaid couches, drinking wine from bowls, eating the best lamb and veal. They strum their harps and sing their little songs while so many die in poverty. Now it is because of the generosity of this congregation that a week ago tonight I was sitting in a couch inlaid with ivory. <laughs> You're already laughing. You know where I'm going with this. Actually, uh, the seats were plastic, uh, and they weren't all that comfortable, but the venue and the, the event just screamed of extravagance. You know I'm talking about the new home of the Minnesota Vikings, U.S. Bank Stadium. We have seen pictures of it being constructed over the past two years. Maybe you have driven by it on Interstate 94 it is a magnificent building, and I hardly need to remind you that it cost more than a billion dollars to construct. One of my pastor friends from a western suburb of Minneapolis a few weeks ago had a long article on the opinion pages of the Minneapolis Star Tribune in which he compares the cathedrals of yesteryear and the cathedrals of today. He specifically lifts up the St. Paul Cathedral in downtown St. Paul, how that's what we used to build a hundred years ago. But today, he argues, our cathedrals are now sports stadiums. He even researched what it cost to build the St. Paul Cathedral a little bit more than a hundred years ago. And if you extrapolate that money over time today, it would cost about a billion dollars to build that cathedral. The same amount of money that it costs to build our sports cathedral, where Hail Marys are more often a vain attempt at points rather than prayers. I don't think Amos would be all that impressed with U.S. Bank Stadium. Probably wouldn't be too impressed with with the St. Paul Cathedral, or with Bethel Lutheran Church, or with Cristo Rey of Carolina. He, he doesn't concern himself so much with buildings, not even the most expensive Solomon's Temple, which if built today would cost hundreds of times more than any of our buildings that we have today. Solomon's not concerned with buildings, he's concerned with the heart. Timothy, too, was concerned with the heart in our second reading. 
He is not impressed with the stuff of this world. He reminds us that we bring nothing into the world. We will take nothing out of the world. Timothy is very worried about those people who go the way of money because that brings a great deal of pain and discontentment. He gives us the most famous phrase about money from the Bible. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Note he does not say that money is evil. Money is just a tool. It is the love of money that is the sin. Then we finally come to our last lesson, the Gospel from Luke, in which Jesus tells a story about a rich man and a poor man. The poor man is named Lazarus. The rich man has no name. In so few words, Jesus sets the table well, telling us about these two men. One is dressed in the most expensive clothing, including linen undergarments, and eats so well every day. While there's a poor man who is clothed only in sores and who would love to satisfy his hunger with morsels that come from the rich man's table. Note it does not say in the Bible that the man actually gets anything from the rich man's table. He would just be satisfied with what falls to the ground. Both men die. The poor man is carried by the angels to the side of Abraham. Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Oh, rock of my soul. Oh, that sounds like a party, doesn't it? And it is for Lazarus. You know, not so much for the rich guy. Dip your finger in the water, come and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented by the flame. Now he's probably not going to be quite so peppy as he begs for his small mercy. I'm sure a song did not come to his mind. Instead, reading the biblical account, one can only assume that this man is groaning while hoping just for a drop of water that would help relieve some of his agony. And then we come to the most challenging part of this story for us. We read that evidently Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham because in this life he has received only evil things and now he is comforted. Conversely, the rich man is in agony because he got his comfort in this life. Not everybody, perhaps, in this room, but most people in this room have more than enough to eat. We have more than enough clothing, more than we know how to wear in our, in our closets and our dressers. We live in secure homes. We are not lying on the pavement outside a mansion in Rochester, Minnesota, just hoping that someone will throw us a stale bun. We are more like the rich man than we are like the poor man. Are we in trouble? Because we have lived relative lives of comfort, does that mean we have an eternity of discomfort ahead of us? Well, I would caution you that we try to read the Bible as a whole. And this is one of Jesus' many teachings about money and possessions in the Bible. An important teaching about money and possessions. But he also has many other things to say. It was only a week ago that Pastor Jason preached on the wise use of money, that we need to be shrewd in our dealings with money. We are not to worship money. Money is only money. But Luke tells us that the Pharisees loved money. That was their sin. A couple of chapters before that, a man welcomes a wayward son home and throws an extravagant party for him, the best robe, a ring on his finger, and the fatted calf. I mean, that sounds like money to me. 
Jesus tells stories about rich fools who tear down barns and bring, bring up bigger barns so they can gather more and more. He also tells stories about children who are not encumbered by adult kinds of problems like money and who can fully embrace the kingdom of God. All of these parables, all these teachings about Jesus point to the heart. This past week, a man, a former parishioner in a parish that I was at a long time ago, died at the age of 98. Gordon was a wonderful man and a very successful farmer. He was very humble about his very large holdings of land in southeastern Minnesota. He enjoyed woodworking. He made most of the furniture in his home. 31 years ago, he made this curio cabinet of walnut and glass and gave it to Kathy and me. And we have cherished this piece of furniture those three decades and more. Gordon was also one of the most generous men that I have ever met in my entire life. You would not know of his great riches by walking into his home. You would know of his great riches by talking to him about his family and his faith. You would know of his great riches by listening to his deep chuckle, accompanied by the crinkling of his eyes as he laughs. You know, I don't think God really cares about the large land holdings of Gordon in southern Minnesota but God does care what he does with them. I don't think God cares a whit about our bank accounts, our IRAs, and our annual salaries, but God does care how we manage them. I don't think God cares even a little bit about Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan and their $45 billion dollars. But God does care that they are giving away billions of those dollars to try and help eradicate all disease in the world in the next 80 years. Amos is not impressed with those who luxuriate while others suffer in poverty. Timothy is unhappy that there are those who will chase money and find much discontentment. Through Luke, Jesus tells us that we need to share what we have with others, not just for their sakes, but for our sakes as well. So we come in a time of our church year at Bethel where just in a couple of weeks, we will be asked to think and pray about how it is that we will give back something to God for God's work through this congregation in 2017. There actually is good news for us people as we joyfully give back some of what God has given to us. We have a great advantage over the rich man. There actually was someone who came and rose from the dead for us. Amen. Hymn 681, please rise and sing.